I especially want to thank and acknowledge the faculty and advisory boards, the first faculty director, uh, and key friends of the Institute for joining the fellows today in what I think promises to be uh, an intimate and very important conversation. The idea for this conversation grew out of a meeting that Professor Metaxas and I had this summer with Ambassador Sherman and Secretary Albright when they started describing their long-standing, enduring relationship and the influence it had had on their own leadership styles, decision-making, and uh, the course of their careers. And they felt, and we certainly agreed, that it would be particularly powerful for them to share their experience. So with that, I'm going to, I have prepared some questions. They may well not be needed, but I'd like to ask you to begin by talking about the relationship that you've had and how it's been consequential to each of you. Well, um, consequential is an understatement. I mean, I think it has been absolutely essential in so many ways. So Wendy and I first met um, in 1984 over politics, which shouldn't surprise anybody. Um, and uh, this was during what was a historic convention in San Francisco when Geraldine Ferraro was named as vice presidential candidate the first time a woman was on a national ticket. And I will talk about what I did, and Wendy can talk about what she did. I um, had been working for Vice President Mondale as he was running as uh, one of his foreign policy people. And I had been his representative on the platform committee that uh, develops a platform for the party uh, on national security strategy. And was very familiar with all his positions. I had known him during the Carter Mondale uh, presidency, and so, um, and I had worked for the National Security Council at that stage, so we really, I knew what his positions on policy was going to be. And Geraldine Ferraro was the chairman of the platform committee. She was a member of Congress from um, Long Island, from Queens, and I had gotten to know her that way. Anyway, she is named as the uh, vice presidential candidate, and I was told that I was going to be her national security person. Um, the boys wondered how that had happened. And so um, I was with her at Lake Tahoe uh, as we were training for her to come down and speak to the convention. Um, and Wendy was there at a different way. Right, so I was there because I was chief of staff to then Congresswoman Barbara Mikulski. And she was a co-chair of the Mondale Ferraro campaign. And in those days, if you were a chief of staff, you were the designated political person. And so she and I traveled around the country in support of the ticket. Uh, so I was at the convention uh, in that role and to help out in that capacity. And I, I guess one thing that's important to say is that <clears throat> our roles with each other have shifted constantly <laughs> over the many years. When we started, uh, the secretary was, uh, as she said, national security advisor in essence to Geraldine Ferraro, and I was chief of staff to Barbara Mikulski, and we worked together. And later on the Dukakis campaign, we were really in common cause because I ran operations for Dukakis out of Washington and then at the Democratic National Committee because the campaign was in Boston, and at this point, the secretary was Michael Dukakis's foreign policy advisor and national security advisor. And so we, she was in Washington a great deal, and we'd have uh, seminars, meetings at her house, fundraisers. We did a lot together, and we came really close friends. And then the role shifted, of course, when I went to work for the secretary of state. Uh, no longer Madeline, my friend, but my boss. Uh, and then we shifted yet again uh, afterwards to being business partners when we started an international consulting firm. So what I think is so remarkable about our relationship is how we have shifted roles in all the ways you appropriately must in those circumstances, maintained our friendship uh, and helped each other every step of the way. I, I do think that what is interesting is 
um, how those roles shifted and how we uh, didn't just maintain our friendship, but strengthened it in many ways. There's one part you skipped, however, which is when um, I was ambassador at the UN and you were an ass assistant secretary for congressional relations in President Clinton's first term. And so I have to say that Wendy's guidance and um, perception about perceptiveness about politics was um, always very valuable. And for those of you, when we did class this morning, uh, when I was talking about the role of Congress, an awful lot of it is something that I learned from Wendy, who really had been up there. The other part that I think is interesting is that Congresswoman Mikulski and Congresswoman Ferraro were very good friends. And as they, um, Barbara Mikulski became a senator and Jerry was a candidate, that friendship was at one level and then Wendy and I were kind of down at the next level and sealed it for all of me. Right, I also have to tell you there are always around very powerful women, women like the secretary. <clears throat> and maybe this is true for me now too in life. There are a group of women who help to get the job done. It, it's never just about us. It's about the people who support us. And um, probably the, one of the best stories around that where the secretary is concerned is there is a very fierce battle about who was going to be secretary of state in Bill Clinton's sec second term, really fierce battle. And uh, we, of course, those of us who were supporters and champions of Madeleine Albright, wanted her to be Secretary of State. Well, at that point, and still in many ways, it was a boy's world, with all due respect to the wonderful men in this room. <laughs> and um, we were trying to do what we could quietly, and obviously uh, then First Lady uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton was perceptive about what was going on. And uh, things were not looking fabulous for the Secretary to become Secretary of State. Uh, the boys were pushing very hard for, I think, probably more than anyone, Dick Holbrook to become Secretary of State. And um, there was a Washington Post story uh, that named guys at the White House as saying that Madeline was second tier. Mm. It was the best thing that ever happened to her. <laughs> and the reason was, we all went crazy. <laughs> and uh, we placed a set of strategic calls, Secretary, uh, uh, Congresswoman, uh, then Senator uh, Barbara Mikulski made some critical calls. Uh, to Al Gore and to Hillary, uh, and at the end of the day, guess who won? But uh, it's interesting because what did happen was um, my name was out there, um, and I literally did not think it was going, didn't occur to me that it would happen. And the first thing that happened was somebody said, a woman can't be Secretary of State because Arab leaders will not deal with a woman. And so then what happened was some of the Arab ambassadors at the UN said, we had no problems dealing with Ambassador Albright. We wouldn't have any problems dealing with Secretary Albright. Then this thing at the White House happened. Um, and I, I had actually did not, you, you may not like this, but I did not want to be the woman candidate for Secretary of State. I wanted to be in case they thought that I might be the best candidate for Secretary of State. And so we, I didn't want this woman's uh, movement. Yeah. Right. And so, but then it's true, the minute the second tier thing came out, um, it, it made it impossible because the women were so furious at what had happened. But I did not believe that I would be Secretary of State for a minute, even to the minute that the phone call happened. So if I can say that 21 years ago last Sunday <laughs> is when you were named the first woman Secretary of State. I want to know if you described yourself as a feminist at that time, and you've shared with me that Ambassador Sherman was influential in your understanding of feminism. Can you talk about that? Well, I, I think that part of this really was that, as I said, I didn't want to just be the woman's candidate. But what I, 
I didn't use the word, I don't think. No. Um, but what I did do that I'm very proud of, and Wendy was very much a part for... By the way, I'm going to back up on something. Wendy <laughs> had been, as I said, Assistant Secretary for Congressional Relations during the Christopher time, and then you left before the term was over um, and went into the private sector. And um, I was very proud that I was able to persuade her to come back. And I remember you saying, why wouldn't I be there at a historical time for the first woman Secretary of State? And so Wendy became my counselor uh, and kind of was in everything. And we did tons of things together um, on policy. And part of what is truly important is you need I mentioned, I've mentioned at various times, it's hard when you take over a job like that. You don't know who everybody is and getting information and how things are gonna go. And so having somebody that was a trusted friend who also knew how the system worked was um, incredibly important. But um, what I did do um, uh, with a lot of uh, influence of Wendy was to for, be the first Secretary of State to make women's issues central to American foreign policy. And not just because I was a feminist, or was because it was very clear that unless women are economically and politically empowered, you are not using the resources of a country. Now, Hillary took it all to a much higher level, but we really did do that together. And the part I think that's so interesting, it now sounds crazy, and by the way, some of you have heard me say this, um, my youngest granddaughter, about uh, eight years ago when she was seven, said, so what's the big deal about Grandma Maddie being Secretary of State? <laughs> Only girls are Secretary of State. And in her lifetime, Condi and Hillary um, were Secretaries of State, and she was interested to see that John Kerry knew how to do it. So, uh, <laughs> so things were very, very different. But I think there really was a question about whether a woman could be Secretary of State. And I didn't have problems with foreign leaders because I arrived in a very large plane that said the United States of America. I actually had more problems with the men in our own government. Um, and not because they were male chauvinist pigs, but because they had known me too long. And that is part of the issue. I had a very kind of slow career in terms of I'd gotten my PhD and I, um, had been a carpool mother and had them over for dinner and um, then was a staffer and made a lot of coffee and Xeroxed and then all of a sudden, as far as they could see, I became Secretary of State and they thought, how did this happen when I should be Secretary of State? So, but having Wendy as somebody that, Wendy called herself a feminist from the day she was born and, um, and I really do think that it made a difference to have somebody that understood better. Right, I think it's partly generational and historical. There are just not a lot of years between us, but just enough uh, that my generation, which really came of political age during the Vietnam War and the women's movement, that, that is my, ident my political identity. And I think that for your generation and uh, others that are, that are here, um, wasn't quite there yet. Uh, and I would say for this generation, and you all have met my daughter who's one step older than you all, 34, I think that uh, a lot of her generation thought the battles were over, yep. that they had been done. Yep. And I don't think she would mind my saying that in the primary election, she voted for Bernie because she didn't think Hillary was progressive enough. And that was her identity, was inclusiveness and diversity and super progressive politics. But when the primary was over, she said to me, seeing what happened in the election, um, how could I have been so stupid? Uh, we need to ensure that a woman becomes president of the United States. And she has, re she's always been a feminist, but she has re-engaged that part of herself and I think I told some of you um, that when the Women's March happened in Washington and she and her friends came down to join the march in Washington, we were making signs and I said, I cannot believe that I am still protesting this, pardon me, bullshit, this many years later and uh, that became my sign except it said BS instead of bullshit. I told you all this story the other day, but it is, it is I think, 
incumbent upon every generation of women and men, because I think more men are now feminists and want the kind of integration of their lives that women have long sought um, to take up this banner because it is not a linear progression. It doesn't all get done. It is, it is the same for the politics of diversity and inclusion and race uh, as it is for gender and ethnicity. These, these battles are not over and uh, we will keep fighting, but they are now yours. They are now yours. So yesterday you referenced the role of courage over the course of your career. You're both, you're each courageous women. How have you helped each other find that courage and to develop that courage and act in that way? Well, I think the courage in, in terms of things we did was to be able to stand up for a policy that others might not like. And I do think that it is important to find an ally. And I think that on various issues that were not easy during the Clinton administration in terms of things that I thought we needed to do in the Balkans, yes. having somebody as counselor that really was the person that said, yes, it's fine, even if they're not very helpful to you, uh, we have to go forward. And then uh, on the Middle East peace uh, aspect of things, Wendy and I, by the way, uh, I think that if I were to say to any of you, would you like to come to Camp David, you'd probably say yes. <laughs> I can tell you after two weeks in the rain with the Israelis and Palestinians, I don't think Wendy and I care if we ever go back. Uh, I, you know, it was very tough, and kind of having somebody that is able to say, okay, that meeting might have not turned out exactly, but we have to go back at it. And um, so having, I, I think the, the uh, title counselor really was very apt for the relationship that uh, Wendy had with me. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think courage is putting those policies forward, but it's also, uh, as we talked about yesterday, courage of knowing who you are what you stand for, and what you are willing to persist to achieve. And um, you know, here we have someone who came here as a refugee, uh, became an American citizen, uh, had learned clearly from her parents whose example was to fight through uh, Nazism, fight through communism, come to this country where you don't know anybody and you don't, that, I mean, I just can't imagine the courage it took. And in my own case, uh, my father was in residential real estate. Uh, and he went to a sermon <coughs> on Rosh Hashanah, uh, which is a very important uh, high holiday in the Jewish religion. And uh, his rabbi had been arrested for sitting in with uh, ministers to desegregate a restaurant. And he thought he owed his congregation um, an answer of why he allowed himself to be arrested. And he said, uh, the sermon was about if I thought about what the clergy said during the time of Hitler. Did they preach to their congregations that they should not have accepted this? And what responsibility do I have to preach to my congregation that they cannot accept uh, that there are no public accommodations in the city of Baltimore? Uh, and my father was very moved by that, and he went and saw the rabbi, and he said, well, what can I do? I'm in residential real estate, and the rabbi said, you can advertise housing open to anyone. There were no such laws on the books in the 50s in Maryland. Uh, and my father said, if I do that, I will lose my business. And the rabbi said, well, you asked me what you could do. This is what you can do. So he went home, and he talked to my mother, and he did it, and they did it. And uh, he did, his business did suffer. He ended up pretty much losing his business over time. He did find Frank Robinson, the most valuable player on the Baltimore Orioles, his first home. Uh, he um, showed me what mattered and when people called our house and said they were gonna bomb it, uh, I understood what courage was about. And so I think whether it is parents who take their child out of harm's way to a place they don't know anything about, which certainly is what immigrants are still doing today and refugees and asylum seekers, 
or standing up for principles of inclusion and fairness and equity, uh, we all have to find whatever courage we can inside ourselves to do the hard things in life. So I want to pivot here for the next few minutes, and then we will open it up to questions that you might have. A key feature to the Albright Institute has been the sustained relationships that the fellows make over a relatively short period of time. At the fifth year, we conducted uh, an assessment, and the fellows absolutely appreciated their faculty, their outside thought leaders. They appreciated the group work. But what they named as most significant was that they formed a friendship that had endured for them. We are trying to find the right language to talk about the role of friendship in creating powerful professional lives, lives of courage. Can you help us with some of that language? Because often those words are soft or traditionally feminine. Can you help us with how to communicate how vital that role of enduring friendships is? I think what's interesting is language does make a difference. And uh, there, is a, there are many differences between men and women. Men network and women have friendships. Um, and the truth is that networking, we don't like to say that it's networking. But I mean, how many times, Wendy and I to this day, the boys keep helping each other. Um, there's no question. And, and I think we have to recognize the fact that networking is not a bad word. Um, and it doesn't um, mean that you're not friends, but there is something different. And the truth is that I can test about it. It makes a difference if you have friends within a networking system that are part of people that you know that you can work with in other places. And when you, I mean, our times in government, it has made a difference if you know somebody and have helped that person uh, and that you come from some kind of a bond. Um, that creates a common understanding of the situation. And because the decisions are not easy, they're not black and white. And so I think it's good if you there's somebody you know that can understand the nuances in decisions and are coming from a similar value system, I think. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. Uh, and it goes to something uh, that we've all talked about, which is uh, having each other's back. <laughs> Uh, because it is a tough world out there. And so in the Situation Room, um, I, we were, a couple of us were talking yesterday afterwards. Um, it was very nice uh, in the second part of the Obama administration, Susan Rice was the National Security Advisor, Avril Haynes and Lisa Monaco were Deputy Assistant uh, National Security Advisors. And so when we'd come into the Situation Room for very tough policy meetings, we went through what we all have gone through, even secretaries of state who are women go through, which is that uh, some uh, woman makes a great insightful comment, nobody pays attention. Uh, five minutes later, some guy in the room says almost the identical same thing, and he's brilliant. Uh, and so we had an unwritten rule among us network of women, and we're not, you know, we, we aren't movie friends. Uh, Avril and Lisa and Susan and I, and there are things on which we disagree. We're not movie friends, but we are professional friends and we are professional colleagues. And so we had an unwritten rule that if something like that happened, one of us would say, Chan, it was so great of you to reinforce what Avril just said. <laughs> uh, because it is that ability to see things for what they are and create your own club because there is a boys club, there is a network. Trust me, there are many more guys at Davos than there are at women, than there are women at Davos, helping each other out, doing deals with each other. We aren't always the people who go on the golf course. In my case, I'm thrilled I don't go on the golf course. <laughs> but, but a lot of business gets done and we have a mutual friend, Barbara Kennelly, who was a member of Congress and she was a, um, statewide golf champion in the state of Connecticut. And she used to go on the golf courses with the guys uh, when she was a member of Congress. And it was helpful, because business got done there. So it's just real life, and we need to embrace it. I think it really is 
uh, important to create group support. And it's something that I have done uh, from the very beginning. And uh, again, when I first got to the United Nations, um, it was one of the first times I didn't have to cook lunch myself. So I asked my assistant to invite the women permanent representatives. And at that time, the UN had 183 members. And I got to my residence, and there were six other women there out of everybody. Uh, from Canada, Kazakhstan, Philippines, Trinidad, Tobago, Jamaica, and Liechtenstein. And because I was the American, I created a caucus. Um, and we called ourselves the G7. Um, and what we did, we promised each other the girl thing that we would always take each other's telephone calls um, and work together. And what we did do as the G7 was to lobby. Uh, there had been a... Um, war crimes tribunal for the crimes that had been committed in the former Yugoslavia, mostly against women. Uh, and we lobbied to get women judges on that war crimes tribunal. We managed with two um, women coming on. But what happened was some male ambassador would come up to me and say, why are you taking a phone call from Liechtenstein? And I said, if you get yourself uh, replaced by a woman, I'd be very happy to talk to you whenever. But it really <laughs> did make a difference. I'm a groupie in that regard. And it really does, it helps to have other women in the room. There's just absolutely no question that it helps. And because I promised that this would be a more intimate time and conversation, I want to ask you, to whom do you turn when you need to make a decision? Well, I mean, people, it depends on the decision, mm -hmm. frankly. But, but I do think uh, that um, I think it is fair to say Wendy and I spend a lot of time to this day thinking about various decisions. Uh, as she mentioned, we were, are still, Wendy's come back to do some things with the business. Um, and just generally in terms of trust and things that, um, that value system is important. Might not always agree. I think that it's fair to say that what, Friendship is really about is being able to disagree about a decision, but it, it, it helps to be able to have that person. And then um, there are a couple of people sitting here, but especially Winnie, um, who has been my friend since childhood. So, um, but I think friendship makes a huge difference. Um, friendship does. I certainly turn to Madeline when I'm making tough decisions. We had a dinner not long ago uh, because after all of the sexual misconduct, sexual harassment, which was just so overwhelming, I, I really felt a deep need to have dinner and just talk about our own experience, where we thought this was going, what our responsibilities were about it. And you can't have that conversation sort of in an unvarnished way with just anybody. Um, I turned to a network of friends and uh, women and, and some men to make important decisions, certainly my husband, uh, my daughter, and my sister. Uh, because you also need people in your life who will tell you the truth uh, and uh, tell you when you've gone too far. Uh, I use my daughter quite frequently. She's more than happy to tell me when I've <laughs> done something wrong, uh, as daughters do, uh, because it's a chance to update your mom on how things are in the world. And so, uh, and I know you rely on your daughters in the same way and your granddaughters. So um, it's, it's important and uh, it's very valuable. I don't have friends in the way that Madeline does back to childhood like Winnie. My life has moved too fast in too many different directions to do that. But certainly since I've been doing national security and foreign policy and politics, I have a cadre of friends, and Senator Mikulski, for whom I worked, was her campaign manager. Our relationship has changed profoundly over the years, and I talk to her virtually every single day. Uh, we are just best friends. 